um, I'm Jessica, that's Soji, and Matthias, and we're going to be talking about kernel ABI and why we care about it, and also give an overview of the libapigel framework. Um, so let's just start off with a general definition. What exactly is the kernel ABI or the kernel application binary interface? So generally speaking, this is just the low-level binary interface between the kernel and its modules. And generally, this consists of a set of structural expectations. So for example, the expectations of the availability of certain exported symbols and um, their symbol ver versioning information if mod version is enabled. Um, there are also expectations of how data structures are laid out, how um, the offsets of certain fields and um, offsets, um, size of structures, alignment, et cetera. So um, ABI checking tools, um, the goal of ABI checking tools is to make sure that we meet these structural expectations and that the modules and the kernel are in agreement with each other. Um, so why do we care about kernel ABI? Um, in a perfect world, we would like to have all modules and drivers in tree and upstream, and we try to strive for that. But unfortunately, reality is a bit more complicated. And in particular, um, Linux distributors do care about maintaining kernel KBI stability for um, primarily out of tree modules from partners and vendors. And the main goal is to uh, basically prevent these third party modules from breaking with routine kernel updates. So for example, if you're a user and you are dependent on this um, hardware driver from a, a vendor that's not upstream, um, you would, it would be really bad if suddenly your system doesn't boot anymore because KBI broke after doing a kernel update. So distributors want to prevent that. And also maintaining um, kernel ABI stability allows us to decouple the development of kernel and its modules and also provide a, a single kernel ABI for an ecosystem of vendor and partner modules. So I'm going to just quickly go over like what existing tools we have upstream for kernel ABI checks. So primarily, I think most distributions rely heavily on um, this configuration, often called mod versions, which um, relies on a program up in the in a kernel called GenKSIMS, which produces all the symbol versioning information. Um, but mod versions is known to have certain limitations that can get kind of annoying at times. Um, generally, we rely on this tool, like I mentioned before, GenKSIMS. That's um, this yak lex based parser. Um, and it's pretty prone, it's uh, prone to reporting false positive KBI breakages, which I'll give a few examples of that. Um, it's sometimes a maintenance pain, and it also has pretty limited reporting of um, when a KBI breakage occurs. Okay, apparently my hair is too long for the mic. <laughs> Okay, so this is just an example KBI report that we get when we're building a SUSE kernel, for example, um, using um, mod versions and GenKSIMS. So basically, when we get a KBI breakage, we get this very small message saying like, hey, this exported symbol CRC has changed. And we don't know exactly why. From, from reading that, we don't know exactly what, um, why the KBI br um, broke and where it broke. Um, and if you turn on, for ex I think there's a debug option somewhere in, in GenKSMs, it would show you like um, that the mod version changed because of uh, changes in this certain struct, but it doesn't tell you what exactly changed in the struct or where the source code change occurred. Oh, it, in the, it does show you there, but then that's just referring to the exported symbol itself. It doesn't show you the source code level change that occurred to break the kernel ABI. And just providing a few uh, examples of limitations of mod versions. Since um, mod versions heavily relies on a parser, and we're basically doing this parsing of pre-processed C source code, um, it's pretty fragile, and um, it could trigger some false positive KBI breakages. Um, for example, I have here, I just changed the struct, and um, at the binary level, nothing has changed. All I have done is basically moved um, the definition of two fields into one line. And this, um, like when I run mod version or gen case limbs, then basically this is reported as a KBI breakage. So you see after I run it, um, it says like, hey, the CRC for um, 
well, for KLP enable patch, um, the mod version changed because there are changes in struct KLP patch. But at a binary level, nothing has actually changed. It's because since we have uh, rely so heavily on the parser, even like um, just any changes in the tree expansion um, will produce a CRC change. So it is relatively fragile in that regard. Um, and this is actually something that libabigil um, really excels in detecting. It does, it's not um, tied by limitations such as these, since we do a static analysis of the ELF binaries themselves. And just wanted to show like how in the um, dwarf debug info, the data member locations of both the two fields I was talking about stayed exactly the same. So this does not constitute as a KBI breakage, even though mod version said it was. And another example, um, since we are doing um, this parsing of in the each individual preprocessed C source code, um, it's also, and we're also limited to the definitions in each preprocessed file. So the inclusion or exclusion of certain header files, it also has an effect on the uh, uh, CRCs that are generated. So for example, um, here if we move a certain uh, definition of this struct static key mod into a header file that changes how the string representation of the expanded tree, uh, tree looks and that also changes the CRC even though all we did was add a header file and that technically does not constitute a KBI, as a KBI breakage. And I found this recent example upstream as well so since we're since Gen K Sims is like a parser so it's relatively fragile and adding, for example, an attribute packed to a struct declaration also breaks um, gen -sims and also does not produce a CRC for it. So, um, so enough about mod versions. We can just talk about um, general distro requirements, what we would like to see in a KABI checker. So um, generally, I think distributions want to do ABI tracking for just a subset of exported symbols. We generally don't track all exported symbols. And normally we don't care about the ABI of entry only symbols or symbols that are only used within a driver or within a set of modules. So a uh, symbol whitelist feature would be useful in a KBI checker. Um, and this feature is also baked into libabigail. So you can provide libabigail with like a symbol whitelist. So a list of symbols that we do care about and report we want um, reports of KBI breakages for. Um, we also, it would be really nice to have human readable KBI reports, not just telling us like a symbol version or mod version, um, a CRC has changed. And having human readable KBI reports will allow us to easily pinpoint the source of KBI breakages and basically save developer time. And uh, we would also really like to have uh, runtime ABI checks. Um, so basically, mod versions does provide us with this, basically checking symbol versioning information at module load time to prevent um, the loading of KBI incompatible modules. And um, we would also like to have the KBI checker not to extend um, the kernel or package build time by too much. So this is something, this is a, this has been a pain point for Lebabigo in the past year, but then Doji and Matthias have done like some really good work on speeding up and improving the um, performance of Lebabigo. And um, with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Doji to talk about, oh, there you have a mic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, so, yeah, just in case, um, I don't, um, to make sure, I mean, who knew Jessica before? Um, so, yeah, so for those who don't, uh, she works at Suze and uh, she is a like proper kernel hacker, uh, kind of, you know, with the silver uh, gold, uh, silver blood, sorry, <laughs> in her veins. Uh, she told me that, you know, kernel hackers have silver blood. I'm a mere uh, mortal here. I don't work on the kernel. Uh, so I have uh, red blood cells. Um, um, I'm mostly a uh, tools uh, hacker. I work for Red Hat. And uh, so, yeah, we met uh, around a, I would say, common goal, which was to try and figure out when um, ABI changes. And, um, and in this case, it was, the idea was to be able to um, not only detect ABI changes, but report them and allow, uh, as Jessica said, for a fine-grained analysis of what changed and what the impact was. 
So fortunately, we started working on um, a framework uh, to analyze ABI um, changes by looking at the binaries and their um, associated uh, debug information a couple of years ago. Um, so the idea was to, um, well, read the ELF information, um, get, you know, uh, the same the, the names of, of, of the symbols uh, that are defined and exported by the binary. And then um, we were also interested in knowing about the, um, you know, actual functions and variables that generated those, um, those symbols. Um, and also know their types, I mean, the return types, the types of their parameters, and being able to walk, you know, those uh, graphs of types and um, and analyze them. So the what we came up with um, is a way to build an internal representation of of those functions, variables, and types. Um, ways to compare those uh, internal representations. You know, making a diff of it, um, and being able also to analyze the diff um, to you know uh, infer um, interesting stuff. So. The result of this is that uh, the framework being a library, uh, we have different tools uh, using the library, um, you know, and those tools are each tailored for a specific task. So, uh, I think a year ago or something, something well, or a couple of months ago, uh, we started working together um, to make the framework uh, understand the Linux binaries uh, better because obviously their uh, specifics. Um, so basically, Linux kernel binaries are a bit, uh, well, are not normal, uh, usual ELF binaries. They have um, their own uh, flavors of uh, symbol tables. Um, so we need to take all these uh, in account. Um, those symbol tables can have various you know, different formats. For instance, uh, since uh, for the uh, 19 on ARM, um, there is a new format possible, so we need to, uh, we need to, you know, be able to grok that. Apparently, recently, there was a, another patch that uh, landed on symbol um, namespaces, like very recently. So uh, we need to be able to understand that as well. It's not done yet, but um, yeah, it's just to, you know, to, to give you examples of uh, the specificity of, of the kernel. And also, uh, the kernel is really big um, compared to you know, the sh system shared libraries we used to um, you know, analyze with, uh, with, with uh, this framework. Basically, we have, you know, I don't know, thousands of modules plus the uh, VM uh, Linux um, binary, which you know, amounts to, I don't know, tens of thousands of of types, uh, that's when they're deduplicated because you can find you find those same times uh, types again and again and again in uh, all the the modules, um, you know, making up that they're, you know, um, I mean every single module reduplicates all those types. So, because we want to build an in-memory representation of <laughs> that uh, kernel plus its uh, module. Um, it takes a lot of time and space. But, well, we made quite some progress on that. Um, today, I think uh, for, okay, the, the fastest thing to process is the Android kernel, uh, because, yeah, of course, Matthias works on the Android kernel. Uh, I think it's, what, less than a minute now? Oh, yeah, less than 30 seconds. Yeah, so basically, just to give you an example, uh, an idea, what we're doing is like linking the entire kernel plus its modules, but during the link, we want to analyze the types, and linkers don't do that today, unless you're doing like things like link time optimization kind of things, but I don't think we're doing that on the kernel yet. So. Uh, I'd like to run you through some examples of uh, the kind of changes that we we can we can detect um, detect today. So, okay, the easiest one is, you know, when we when a new function has been added, 
this is not a breakage, but you know, it's nice to be able to, to see that. That was the uh, easy uh, part. So for instance, we are, okay, here what you're saying is, okay, you have the source code here, and for this change in the source code, which is basically re-numbering uh, some enum here, and that enum, as you can say, is used um, indirectly by a function uh, here, right? This one. Um, if you run um, the, a comparison of the, uh, banner, the two binaries, you know, that have this uh, change, this is what you, you're having. So it's quite detailed, uh, quite verbose, some, someone would say. But this is the kind of information we, we can deduce from looking at just the binary and its debug info. We know the name of the function that has been impacted uh, at which um, line in its source code. We know that it is the first parameter, and we know that the enumerator changed, and the uh, value changed from one to two, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the level of detail we want to have as opposed to just saying, well, uh, CRC, CRC change somewhere, you don't really know, uh, really know why. So, um, another uh, example which is uh, easy to detect is uh, the removal of, of, of a function. Uh, this is actually an um, ABI break, so it's nice to be able to catch that. Um, an interesting one, which is more related to types is what happens when you add a new um, data member to a structure, for instance. And so what happens is, well, you, you, you can have two types of, of changes. One is, okay, suppose, so this is the stru structure that changed. We added a new data member in there, which named new member. and. Uh, have a look here at the functions using the uh, that structure. There is one function using it um, as a parameter passed by a value here, and another function is using it as uh, you know a pointer, a, a parameter which which is a pointer to this uh, structure. So in the first case, uh, there. So the report tells us that we have two functions that have been impacted. Um, the first one is the one I guess we are really interested in, which has the parameter passed as a value. Um, so it says clearly that here, you know, uh, the structure, uh, the data member has been inserted, and it tells us about you know the impact on the size of 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 the structure. And in the second case, the interesting thing is that we see that uh, the change here is indirect. I mean, the first parameter is a pointer, and it is the pointy to type that changed. So I guess in the second case, the second case is an impact okay, of the type change. So it's nice to be able to have it, uh, to, you know, to have that, that impact, and to have actually the list of all the functions that have been impacted by, by this change. Um, but strictly uh, speaking, the real breakage is on the first uh, on the first one. Yeah. Oh. 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 Uh, yeah. So uh, assume the second function takes the pointer, and it assumes it's a r an array. It, it does a pointer plus plus, and you're broken. So no, it's the same problem. Oh yeah. So th don't say it's not that I interesting. No, you care about both, and you care about both equally. Okay. So, well, I'm glad you say that because um, there have been ongoing discussions, you know, among users, um, to the point where we actually have several kinds of reports today. So this report is the one that is the most uh, verbose, um, but we do have some reports where. The only thing that is shown is what we call the leaf change. I mean, the real change, the change on the type itself. And then 
uh, below it, you will have like the list of impacted functions because folks didn't want to know about all the impacted function and so on and so forth. But if you say like it's important, then well, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, my point, I guess, was to say that it is possible to, um, to handle the kind of verbosity you know, of, of the, of the uh, output. Um, I, I kind of agree that I would consider that a, as a maybe eye breakage that I want to avo avoid, definitely. I think the comment in the bottom, um, uh, if, if I read it out, or in, in general it says um, that and that very interface, it's not a breakage that will actually cause a, a classic crash or something, but whatever happens afterwards obviously is bad. And the thing is also um, what, what Jessica mentioned earlier, if, if that struct uh, definition is not available here, Ab uh, Abigail would not be able to detect it either um, because you only uh, take the point of it. Um, so that's some interesting comments here. This, I definitely would like to see that um, also in the cases where the definition is not uh, uh, available through header, um, but that's a tricky thing to do, yeah. at least as of now, because we only uh, derive from elf and from dwarf so far. Actually, I don't know if you grasped what he just said about having the definition not being av available through header, uh, header file. Well, uh, um, actually what happens is that because we're using, we're only looking at the, uh, at the, um, the binary, what is available or not through a header file uh, is not really, I mean, libabigail doesn't really look at that. It looks at the binary, so we would see all those um, types, even if they were not defined in header files, okay? And then the problem is <laughs> uh, some of those uh, types that are not defined in a header file are probably meant to be private. And at this point, we don't know that yet. Um, but there are ways to know that, and I think in the future we would need input from uh, you guys if you're interested in like, for instance, uh, telling the tool that, okay, if the type is defined in this header file, this header file, and that one, then these types are public and we care about them. Otherwise, don't, you know, don't report changes on those types. You see what I mean? Uh, but for now, uh, we're just uh, displaying everything. So. Um, yeah, uh, an interesting thing that uh, Jessica mentioned, um, you know, in the passing, I don't know if you remember, uh, with the JNK sim uh, machinery, when you have a, uh, a change to the name of a, of a data member, that change was, um, would impact the CRC, basically. So here, you see that uh, uh, it's not exactly the same change, but it's the same family of changes. Here, the, the name of the data member changed. We actually detect that uh, in the framework, but we filter the change out because it's not an ABI break, obviously. Um, but if you want to see these kind of changes that are uh, deemed uh, harmless, you can tell the tool to show you also the, the harmless uh, changes. So we can do these kind of things because the ch um, we do have a, an internal representation of the diffs as well, and so we can analyze the diffs and, and decide uh, whether things are important um, or not. So, uh, yeah, and another interesting kind of, of, of changes um, that, are, that are flagged are, you know, changes that are that don't change the, um, the size or change the layout, uh, the binary layout of a structure. So here, typically, uh, the, the data member B got replaced by something, by, by something with uh, the same size, okay? So it's a change, but not a kind of layout change. So if we were not looking at types, um, as a programmer will be, if we were just looking at you know offsets and so on and so forth, we wouldn't be able to detect uh, this kind of thing. So we detect it and report it as you know a data member change, and what change here is the type of the data member. So it's meaning. So we're interesting, I think, in in that as well. Even if 
strictly speaking, it's not an ABI, um, you know, change. So, oh, wow, I did something I shouldn't have. So, yeah, that's all for me, and I'll... Yeah, hi, I'm Matthias. I work on Android for Google, and in particular on the kernel um, and around. Um, yeah, why is that interesting for us? Um, that's less technical, maybe. Um, not sure how many people of you know, but uh, Android has gone has gone through some uh, quite some interesting changes in regards to updatability um, in the framework, like everything that is on top of the kernel. Um, to actually separate the vendor bits from um, the generic bits that every Android device needs. Um, and a similar thing uh, has not yet really happened to the kernel as well, um, but that's, that's our interest that we actually um, separate the vendor bits again from, uh, from the generic kernel. And so we're having a project that's called a generic kernel image um, to actually produce such a, such a kernel image um, that can be generic for all sorts of devices. And um, the main driver behind that is um, the, the really crazy fragmentation that we see right now of how kernels are forked for different devices and that we don't have really a common uh, code base for, uh, or like a common kernel code base. There is, but there's a lot of fragmentation. Um, so we are trying to, uh, or we are creating a generic kernel image and modules that come along with them. And as, as, as a generic part that is um, common for all the devices, um, so that um, vendors can actually um, chip in their um, vendor parts, like drivers um, that they want to keep closed and they cannot have in three for various reasons. Um, and for them, we want to expose a stable <coughs> API, <coughs> sorry, ABI slash ABI. Um, meaning everything that is exported from the kernel image and, and the modules, like the GKI modules. Um, we don't obviously want to do that for main lane because of various reasons. Um, so we, we restrict on how we want to do that, like what is the scope, what is in, what is not in. For example, we, we only take um, LTS releases. We are not, uh, we are not uh, trying to keep any mainline things uh, stable and we're also not uh, trying to keep LTS from the very beginning stable. So once it is released in LTS for Android devices, uh, we, we want to keep it stable. So that, that will be for Android uh, 4.19 and uh, 5X, whatever that will be. Um, in addition, we only want to keep um, very specific configurations um, stable, in particular one single configuration that is suitable for most or all vendors. And Configuration changes are okay as long as they're not breaking the ABI or as long as you can mitigate uh, any breakages. Um, then we enforce a tool chain. Uh, we use a Clang-based uh, tool chain and we are working on, on something we call hermetic build to really enforce that whatever is, like I think the, the Debian pro uh, project is a bit ahead with the reproducible builds. We, we, we target that um, to make sure we actually really know all the components that go into the build um, for sure that can potentially affect the ABI. Um, we want to also scope the ABI. We just, like, at the moment, we are just um, saying whatever is part of the exposed and observable ABI is what, what we care about. That will not be um, in the future like that. We will uh, like introduce whitelists and suppressions for the, for the symbols that we actually care about. Um, but that's a bit work in progress. Um, yeah. The idea how we integrate that is, yeah, these are just boring build scripts, but the idea is um, we, in, in, in our build scripts, we actually um, contain all these things like um, a, a hermetic build environment, which um, makes sure the, the, the right tool chain is used, um, correct environment settings, whatever you need to make sure everyone on every machine gets the exact same result, especially when it goes down to partners and on different distributions. So we are not building all on one Debian or whatever. We, we are building on whatever it is uh, the, the vendor has as his main distribution. Um, and we also integrate on the other side, bes besides the build itself, um, the ABI tooling, which is ABI DW and ABI DIFF, which are tools from LibAbigail, to create a report. Um, yeah, we are quite, quite far with simplifying that process so that really actually everyone can get access to that, including our partners. Like it's uh, like literally repo init, which is 
uh, repo is a tool that yeah, combines several Git repositories, um, including the toolchain um, sync, which is basically a, a fetch and pull. And build ABI, the, 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 the combination of the builds. Um, with that in place, uh, every, every user can actually uh, reproduce ABI reports uh, locally, uh, but we also enforce them um, to some extent in our um, central infrastructure. So as soon as someone wants to do a change to a LTS uh, branch or to a monitored branch, um, our um, continuous integration system will do that before, e uh, before these kind of changes are landed. In that case, I took one snapshot of our um, uh, Garrett system and made a very, uh, very rude change there and it immediately told me, okay, there is a data member insertion and roughly 6,300 interfaces are impacted by that, so you rather would not like to do that. And, and that's what happens immediately and it, it's flagged red and um, yeah, people are supposed to not break it. Um, yeah. Yeah, we use libabigail. Libabigail, as uh, the mechanics of libabigail are quite easily uh, described as um, you create the binary uh, as usual with the build, just we contain it with the uh, hermetic build. Uh, you extract an ABI uh, in an ABI representation, that's an XML, and later on you compare it. Um, we consider, like Ab Abigail um, considers um, ELF symbols and the corresponding dwarf information for that. Um, oh, that slide is outdated. 419 kernels are now uh, supported. Jessica made the patch and it landed last week or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. between right. after plumbers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's just a glimpse how that looks. Um, so you can see the, this representation just contains the symbols, um, variables and, and functions and the the extracted ABI uh, dwarf information for that. Um, for example, we uh, contain also the, the enum uh, declaration, uh, the enum values if we if we know them. Um, yeah, it goes on, gone uh, like with arrays and pointers to and, and various types that that are represented there. Um, then there are quite some interesting cases that we are not yet really able to to help. Um, or like to, to uh, where, we, where we need help to detect them and we are working on that. For example, take this um, enum, which is um, at least my OCD triggers to sort them, um, which creates a patch that is an API breakage. Um, unfortunately, it's an untagged enum, so it will not appear in any API, uh, or in, in not in any ABI. Um, in fact, the code that um, picks one of these values and returns it returns it as an int. Um, so we are not actually able to um, like capture that from just elf and dwarf. So one, uh, one idea um, of, of dealing with that is to actually create code at uh, compile compilation time to uh, manually tag these enums and export them into uh, symbols. Like for example, this uh, dummy code would, would be something we could uh, create and, um, yeah, and capture it as an elf symbol. And, as soon, uh, and from that moment on, um, everyone, uh, like it is part of the ABI that we want to keep stable. Um, the other cases, um, defines, which go through, um, uh, like go through includes and uh, not really traceable um, either. Um, here again, we can do a very similar uh, trick to capture these in, uh, in an enum. You could actually also define them as proper types. Um, that, that's also one way of doing it. Um, I just went with the, with the method that we are currently approaching because we are able to, uh, to do that, right? Uh, as at least we have a prototype for that. Um, and it works pretty good. Um, don't kill me for the examples. They are really um, dumb. The, no one should actually change that in that way, but um, it's just to illustrate. Um, yeah, also um, we, we can see that uh, task killable in that case is actually something we, we capture as, even though it's a, it's a combination of um, maybe uh, several levels of um, uh, defines, um, we are able to, to capture the actual value um, as is, as the result. It might be changing through a config change. Um, so as I said earlier, if you want to change, the configuration should be ABI compatible. If the config change such a define, we need to find out um, because it might break. Even though there is a, 
the line we cross a bit between API and ABI. Okay, that's all I had to add to that. Um, thank you very much so far. Do you have any questions? I'm good with the... I'm good with early coffee. Ah, there's a question. Oh. Right, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, question. Do you have any plans to actually feed back into a code itself? Uh, are there cases where you consider that the code should be done better so that it can be analyzed uh, in more easily? Uh, you mean um, upstreaming improvements, uh, upstreaming improvements that help us in the future? Uh, I mean, things like uh, you define an NM and then you don't use it and as a as a type and instead use ins. Yeah. Uh, do you consider something like that to be bad practice that if, if there, we I should mean, be not doing? I think for some of the things, it's it might be tricky to get consensus through all maintainers whether defines are a good thing or whether we should make it types or whether we can tag that enum and whether return an int. So it might be difficult to find consensus. But um, I, I personally think um, if we have a chance to um, upstream changes that um, like fix this for us without any code generation, without any further doing, and it's still valid and good code, I think we should do it. And actually, as part of the Android kernel, we, we have the upstream, upstream first policy. So every, every change that we want to make to the code base uh, has to be considered and upstreamed first, unless it's really only Android specific. Okay. Is that Thanks. helping? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I think Steven said something like uh, BPF, whatever you say, I say BPF first. Um, yeah, no, but seriously, um, I think uh, less than a month ago or something, so the um, the debug information of uh, BPF, uh, the debug information format of BPF, which is BTF, uh, you know, got merged into the kernel. So at some point, I think uh, people will want to be able to, you know, analyze stuff from the, you know, BPF, BPF standpoint. And for these guys as well, having things uh, being well typed will be useful. Um, so what you're talking about, about you know, uh, having uh, code changes uh, in, you know, general code changes to type things a bit more so that things like BTF can make more sense of, of you know, whatever is going on is going to be, I mean, the consensus is going to be <laughs> um, easier, f you know, found, I, w I would say, uh, with these things getting in. Actually, I did not try to, to upstream such things, um, so I, I don't know whether there is consensus or not. So. As long as it makes sense. <laughs> to whom? <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, the comment was, as long as it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so my question, you, s you said that the uh, Android kernel runs in uh, 10 seconds for uh, running libabigail Lib 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 on it. Uh, how big is the machine that you need to run it? So can we actually uh, ask contributors to run the, this kind of things, or can we integrate that in our custom CI system that we have? Um, that uh, ABI extraction is, uh, as of now, single-threaded. You don't need any fancy hardware for that. Um, it, it runs on my workstation. It probably depends on the notebook. It might take twice the time. Um, so it's it's fairly okay. Maybe you want to comment on the distribution kernel for that. Um, how how long it takes and what your experience is. Well, in the past, um, running uh, or trying to serialize the ABI for um, say the five one kernel was the one I tried with uh, basically a standard distro configuration with like over three thousand modules and over twenty thousand symbols. Um, in the past, has taken quite a very long time, so I would say around, was it valid for, like, yeah, at some point it was 30 minutes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, like infinity, and then um, gradually over time, improvements have been pushed upstream to Lib Abigail, and I think now with this rec very recent speed improvements, we've gotten ABI serialization down to, I think it was like around two to three minutes. So things are progressing quite nicely in that regard. But can, can we please make this work? Can we please make sure that not everybody like the script kit is now start reporting ABI breakage when we change a single thing in the kernel? I mean, I'm going to go nuts on that. I mean, I, I fundamentally think <laughs> KABI <laughs> is broken and is the wrong approach. It's fostering something which should have been not there in the first place, and the Big distro guys are proliferating that forever. I fundamentally hate it. A lot of people hate it, and it's just a waste of engineering resources because the time people spend on creating that extra ABI compatibility layer, they should better be working on upstream kernel stuff than uh, being buried away in KABI caves in some distro uh, department. But that's my personal opinion. But what I really wa don't want to see is the script kid is having a new um, fancy tool and say, oh, you broke the breakage because you added a struct member. It's going to happen, and I throw it all over the fence to you. Uh, th yeah, thanks, thanks for that comment. I, I will take that really in, and I want to refer to a, 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 an earlier slide where all the conditions are put that, that we put in on, on which this applies. Right. Like yeah. the right branches, the right configurations, the right tool chains, uh, the right list of, of symbols that we care. And we are not uh, like in and like it's bound and explicitly not mainline. It's bound on a purpose. That's if you have that in the documentation and I think that should do the trick because then we just can point to people and say, Hey go there, read and understand this. But if I have to explain them every time that what they are doing is wrong, no it's not going to happen. No, I throw it over the fence. Yeah. I'm I'm willing to take it. Yeah, <laughs> if that happens. And my point when I was asking whether I can run it is, as a maintainer, should I? Uh, I want to know in advance that this is going to be an ABA breakage or not, and when we backport it in in other distribution, what kind of impact it will have? It's not something that I do not want to enforce contributors to actually fix the ABA breakage because we need to have. ABI breakage sometimes from time to time. But I want to know that this is an ABI breakage and what kind of impact it will have. Why because care? Yeah. I care because when I have to backport things in RHEL, I actually need to know. Distro. Yeah, it's a distro clear. Yeah. The, the maintainer doesn't care, but it's something I, I prefer being one uh, in advance that this is something I will have to take care in a few months when I will have to do the backport as a distribution. It's That's your personal problem. I, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> and I mean, the, 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 the whole point is, and, uh, and I mean, it was discussed bringing KABI upstream uh, decades ago, and everybody hated it for the right reasons. And no, we couldn't change anything anymore if we would have done that, and that would be a total disaster. So kernel development should, shouldn't just care about that and just move on. And then, yeah, let the distros do what they think is the right thing. I still think it's wrong. In the in the original set of the slides, I also had a reference to um, stable API nonsense to like actually say that is what is like upstream. I completely agree, and upstream I also include the LTS branches. Um, in that case, um, what I'm talking or what we are talking about is clearly downstream. Yeah. yeah. There's certainly a value to have tools like that. I mean, if you if you look at user space uh, libraries and things like that, where you care about interoperability and th and and these kind of things, or even at the at the kernel a syscall ABI layer, uh, level, this might be useful to actually integrate into testing because then we can prove on on the technical level that we didn't change at least the structure of the ABI. It doesn't tell you whether we changed functionality. That's a totally different problem. But 
you can tell, hey, somebody made a change to a data structure, which then indirectly affects uh, a syscall, which would be wrong. There, I totally agree, the tools are good. Um, actually, in, um, in uh, you know, user space um, development, <laughs> the same thing holds. I mean, upstream, people don't really care about ABI, usually, um, until they care. Like, um, so for in, in development, for instance, you, when you're developing a new branch, uh, some project really don't care. I mean, if you talk to the Mozilla people, for instance, um, well, they usually don't care. But the issue is when you want to care, depending on your conditions, then you want to be able not to forbid a change, but at least to see it and see its impact. And so you know what you're going to do or not. So I was talking about the Mozilla people on, I don't know, their Geeko engine, they don't care. But the SSL guys um, in the same project, they do care. So yeah, the idea is just to you know provide tools to people. And then what you do with it is where the, you know, the real wisdom is, I guess. Yeah. Where's the? Um, so I, I wrote uh, a little network ton driver for the NT kernel, the Windows kernel, uh, recently. It was not a pleasant experience. Um, and uh, one of the reasons it was so unpleasant is because um, they worked from the beginning to keep a stable ABI so that like vendors could write drivers that would last for centuries or something. And so every struct has, is versioned sometimes just by its size that's then written as the first variable in the struct. Um, the functions all have uh, versions attached to their names. Uh, the constants are all versioned. And uh, you can see that it was a lot of work. That they planned it out. They did it well. Um, and I guess it kind of works, but um, it's, of course, atrocious to develop for. And I can imagine the team at Microsoft <laughs> that has to maintain this is uh, equally miserable, which is why I can see you know, Thomas screaming, oh, God, we don't want this upstream. We won't be able to program anymore. It just won't become a fun, fun project. So I, I wonder for, uh, for Android and the things you guys are working on, uh, as, as you do need to add new things or change stuff and still keep compatibility, or if you want the generic kernel image to be updated, but you want to keep these old drivers, then you're going to have to be wrangling function calls and structs from previous ones, or you're going to introduce versioning on top of that or modify the GK, or how are you... How are you going to not make this as awful as it is for NT? No, like we don't want to keep anything compatible between different LTSs, for example. We don't want to keep 419 somehow compatible with 5.4, let's say. So we take it at the moment that it's released where like active development has at least calmed down. And we try to implement new features for Android, not in these. We try to avoid to do uh, backports by all means. To, to get it upstream first, um, so when it when it comes with the version that we want to adopt for for Android, it's there in done and things have calmed down. I, I'm not. So we don't want to we don't want to introduce ABI and and we also intend because like Susan Red Hat cannot do that, but we also are able to break ABI uh, occasionally. Let's say every release and every year or something. Yeah, I'm not totally certain that. Um that even within a version, even not spanning LTS, it's going to be that that simple. For uh, for for WireGuard, I write it for the latest upstream, but then I backport it all the way back to 3.10. And I've noticed even within each stable release, uh, I have to have tons of new compat hacks, like for everyone, because even those function signatures are changing. Are, are you planning just to not? Or certain things, or so maybe to to give some some background on that the, the Android kernel as is as it's released, um, like the generic kernel that we are talking about, 
has currently, like Android Common Kernel has currently roughly 100 patches on top. We are down from like several thousand down to 60 to 100, depends on how you count. Um, so a lot of these things have, have gone upstream. Um, we, we strictly want to avoid having any new feature backported unless it's really necessary. Um, but, I mean, even aside from features, just the internal ABI changes. I mean, upstream developers do not care about the ABI within the kernel. They want to make the most efficient program with the nicest function signatures. And so even, I've noticed, between stable releases within the same major release, it but, changes But again, a lot. We, we have more scope. We have um, a configuration that we support, and we have a surface that we want to su support. And that, that surface is what actually all vendors need, typical drivers for mobile devices. It's not like we want to keep everything stable. Nevertheless, if we, if we have our configuration right now, <coughs> we see we get, we get weekly LTSs and we, we consume them usually uh, within a couple of days. Um, we see a reported breakage that we should consider. Not every release. It's every other or every three releases that actually something um, breaks or that, that something is reported broken. Um, we did not yet do enough or we don't have enough data to say are these all um, are we able to mitigate all of these easily or like most of them um, we don't have that data yet um, but yeah so, so is the plan I understand kind of your ad concern. ad hoc fixes for each one as they come up depending on what's necessary you know rename the new function and implement on top of the old kind of thing just as they come up is that the general plan or um, we don't see that too much there. Actually, a proper rename of a function in an LTS release? I uh, what I mean is if you have, if the function signature changes for the, LT, for the LTS release, like if it adds an argument, but then you still need to keep the old one around, then you can rename the new one and keep the old symbol and have the... Again, I know, did have not see that too often, but okay. I suggest you take this offline. It, it sure. turns into a conversation between us, and I don't want to bore the whole room. Um, but I'm I'm really happy to to continue with that um, afterwards if you're if you're willing to. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, one common cause of uh, API and ABI breakage I have experienced myself within my own code. So it's not uh, about uh, missing the sources or whatever is uh, changing the return domain of a function. Typically, you have a function which is uh, typed as an integer. Uh, you start to use it to return uh, two or three values. You don't care about negative values, but uh, it's uh, much faster to type int uh, than uh, unsigned int, so we all do this. And uh, suddenly, you have some uh, specific error codes to return, and you start to uh, use the negative values, for example, uh, and the callers don't know it. And uh, I have been caught regularly introducing uh, bugs in my own code just because I did not even know that some callers did not expect this to happen or were misusing these values. Uh, is this something you, you think about uh, checking one way or another? I don't even know how it is possible to check this. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole category of things that we are um, not able to, oh, I think it's oh. proximity. Um, there's a whole category of things that you are not easily able to check right now, um, also because of how we extract the data right now. Um, but we we are working on finding new cases, so I'm, um, I will talk to you definitely to, to get some um, proper use cases out of this, um, to, to extend that coverage, to, to make it more useful. And then, obviously, it will be too much, and we have to introduce some suppressions there, <coughs> consider it more harmless. And, there's the whole category of actually logical changes that we might or might not be able to detect. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, it's... <laughs>